August 11, 2024. 19th Sunday in Ordinary Time. Introduction. Dear brothers and sisters, the readings for the 19th Sunday in Ordinary Time Year B remind us of God's unwavering provision and care. From Elijah's angelic meal to the psalmist's invitation to taste God's goodness, from Paul's call to embody God's love to Jesus' offer of himself as the bread of life, we see a cohesive message, God is our provider and sustainer. In today's first reading, we find the prophet Elijah in a moment of despair. He is exhausted, fleeing from Queen Jezebel who seeks his life. In his desperation, he prays for death. But God responds not with reprimand but with care. An angel provides Elijah with food and drink, sustaining him for a journey of forty days and forty nights to Mount Horeb. Psalm 34 is a song of praise and thanksgiving, extolling God's goodness and deliverance. The psalmist invites us to taste and see that the Lord is good, emphasizing the intimate and experiential nature of God's care. In the second reading, St. Paul instructs the Ephesians on how to live in a manner pleasing to God. He urges them to be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. This passage challenges us to emulate God's love and compassion in our interactions with others. Paul's exhortation to be imitators of God means we are called to live out the love and forgiveness that we have received from God. Just as God provides for our needs and cares for us, we too must extend that love and care to those around us. Our lives should reflect the grace and mercy we have experienced. In the Gospel, Jesus declares himself to be the bread of life that came down from heaven. He speaks of the true sustenance he offers, not merely physical food but the spiritual nourishment that leads to eternal life. Jesus contrasts the manna that the Israelites ate in the desert, which sustained them temporarily, with him, the living bread that grants everlasting life. Jesus, as the bread of life, offers himself as the ultimate fulfillment of our deepest hungers and needs. The First Reading 1 Kings 19 verses 4 to 8 In preparation for the lesson taught by Jesus in the Gospel, the Church presents today's first reading, which recounts a pivotal episode in the life of the prophet Elijah, his journey to Mount Sinai to seek strength from Yahweh. Two Sundays ago, we briefly discussed the prophet Elijah and the deep veneration generations of Jews held for him after his death, extending right to the time of Jesus. Elijah lived during the reign of King Ahab over the kingdom of Israel, one of the two kingdoms into which Solomon's realm was divided after his death. King Ahab was wicked, but his wife Jezebel, the daughter of a pagan king, was even more malevolent. Under her influence, most of Israel had abandoned Yahweh to worship Baal, a prominent idol in the region. Elijah was one of the few remaining prophets of Yahweh, while hundreds of prophets served Baal, all sustained by the queen. In an effort to bring the people back to himself, God caused a severe drought in the region. Not a drop of rain fell for three and a half years, leading to widespread famine. Distressed, King Ahab had no choice but to consult Elijah. The prophet instructed the king to gather the people on Mount Carmel, along with Baal's prophets. Once assembled, Elijah challenged the king in front of all the people. Let two bulls be brought, he said, and two altars erected, one for Baal and the other for Yahweh. Let the bulls be slaughtered and placed on their respective altars to be burnt. No fire should be applied. The bull that is consumed by fire from heaven will reveal the true God, whether Baal or Yahweh. The crowd welcomed the challenge, and the king could not refuse. From morning till afternoon, the prophets of Baal circled their altar, invoking their God, shouting, 
and beating their breasts, but to no avail. When Elijah's turn came, he offered a short prayer to Yahweh, and fire descended immediately, consuming the bull on Yahweh's altar. The crowd erupted in acclamations to Yahweh. Seizing the moment, Elijah ordered the execution of Baal's 400 prophets, the deceivers of Israel, and the people eagerly complied. None escaped, and the entire assembly acclaimed Yahweh as their God. That very afternoon, rain fell abundantly, ending the drought. Upon hearing this news, Jezebel flew into a rage and vowed to kill Elijah within 24 hours. The prophet fled for his life, first to the kingdom of Judah and then further south into the desert. This is where today's first reading finds him, utterly discouraged despite his triumph on Mount Carmel, begging God to end his life. He lay down under a bush and fell asleep, hoping not to wake again. However, an angel woke him and provided him with a fresh ration of bread and water. Strengthened by this food, Elijah traveled through the desert for 40 days until he reached Mount Horeb, another name for Mount Sinai, some 500 kilometers from where the angel had appeared to him. What sustained the prophet and enabled him to continue his mission to turn the people away from idol worship was his encounter with Yahweh at the very place where Moses had received the Ten Commandments. This passage serves as the backdrop to today's Gospel, where Jesus once again declares himself to be the bread of life for all humanity, this time through the Word of God which he had come to proclaim. This declaration signifies that just as Elijah was strengthened by the heavenly bread and water to continue his divine mission, so too are we sustained by Jesus, the true bread of life, through his teachings and sacrifice. The second reading, Ephesians 4 verses 30 to 5 verse 2. Once again, Paul from his jail in Rome presents us with a jewel of a passage from his letter to the Christians of Ephesus. At baptism, God presented us with the gifts, the gift of the Spirit, the source of genuine Christian joy at individual and community level. He warns against destructive attitudes like bitterness, which he describes as a deep-seated hostility that can escalate into wrath, brawling, and blasphemy. Colossians 3 verse 19, Paul stresses the importance of avoiding bitterness because it grieves the Holy Spirit. God the Son who died for our sins, and God the Father who forgave us. Bitterness often escalates into wrath, an outward explosion of inner anger, which can lead to brawling, physical fighting, and blasphemy, verbal conflict. These behaviors are regrettably common among Christians, prompting Paul to remind his readers of the beauty and importance of unity, as noted in Psalm 133 verse 1. Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Paul provides three compelling reasons to avoid bitterness. First, it grieves the Holy Spirit, who dwells within Christians. When our hearts are filled with bitterness and anger, the Spirit grieves, much like parents feel when their children fight. The Holy Spirit thrives in an atmosphere of love, joy, and peace producing these fruit of the Spirit in our lives as we obey Him. Though the Holy Spirit will not leave us, as He has sealed us until Christ's return, our sinful attitudes can rob us of the joy and fullness of the Spirit's blessings. Second, bitterness grieves God the Son, who died for our sins. Third, it grieves God the Father, who forgave us when we trusted in Christ. Paul identifies the root cause of a bitter attitude as an inability to forgive. An unforgiving spirit becomes the devil's playground, turning into the Christian's battleground. When we refuse to forgive those who hurt us, bitterness takes root and hardens our hearts. Instead of being tender-hearted and kind, we become hard-hearted and bitter, harming ourselves more than the person who wronged us. Bitterness makes us treat others the way Satan would, rather than how God treats us. In his kindness, God has forgiven us, 
and we should extend this forgiveness to others. We forgive not just for our own sake or even for the sake of others, but for Jesus' sake. Learning to forgive and forget is a secret to a happy Christian life. Paul then elaborates on the concept of being followers of God, which translates to being imitators of God as beloved children. He points out that children often mimic their parents, whether in positive or negative behaviors, learning more by observation and imitation than any other way. As children of God, we should strive to imitate our Father. This forms the basis for Paul's three admonitions. God is love, so we should walk in love. Ephesians 5 verses 1 to 2. God is light, so we should walk as children of light. Ephesians 5 verses 3 to 14. And God is truth, so we should walk in wisdom. Ephesians 5 verses 15 to 17. Each of these walks is part of Paul's broader exhortation to walk in purity. This admonition connects with the final verses of the previous chapter, where Paul warns against bitterness and anger. These destructive attitudes are especially tragic when they manifest in the family of God. Genuine love in the heart is essential, for charity, love, shall cover the multitude of sins, 1 Peter 4 verse 8. The Gospel Exegesis John 6 verses 41 to 51 Two Sundays ago, we saw Jesus multiplying bread and fishes to feed the crowd that had been listening to him for hours. In the mind of Jesus, the miracle was meant to serve as preparation for the people to grasp and accept his teaching on the bread of life, which he would impart the next day at the synagogue of Capernaum. It was long discourse which, with the multiplication of the loaves, fills the whole of chapter 6 in the Gospel of John, and in which, as we explained last Sunday Jesus declared himself to be the spiritual food of mankind in three ways, through faith in him, through God's word, and through the Eucharist. The Jews expected a messianic figure that would perform signs similar to Moses, who provided manna, bread from heaven, during the Israelites' journey in the desert. Jesus' claim to be the bread of life directly engages with these expectations but shifts the focus from physical sustenance to spiritual sustenance. Jesus speaking about being the bread of life would have resonated deeply with a Jewish audience familiar with the significance of bread as both a daily necessity and a symbol of God's provision. Our Lord's statement, For I came down from heaven, John 6 verse 38, disturbed the religious leaders, for they knew it was a claim of deity. They thought they knew Jesus, who he was and where he came from, see Matt, 13 colon 53 58, John 7 verses 40 to 43. Jesus, of course, was the legal son of Joseph but not his natural son, for he was born of a virgin, Luke 1 verses 34 to 38. The leaders identified Jesus with Nazareth in Galilee, not Bethlehem in Judea, and they thought that Joseph was his natural father. Had they investigated the matter, they would have learned who Jesus really is. Even in the days of Moses, the Jews were known for their murmuring, Exodus 15 verse 24, 17 verse 3, Numbers 14 verse 2. Perhaps the leaders and some of the crowd had now moved into the synagogue to continue the discussion. The main issue was, where did he come from? Five times Jesus used the phrase, came down from heaven, but they would not accept it. They judged things by human values and by external standards. Their reaction in face of the claim of Jesus was to produce the fact that he was a carpenter's son and that they had seen him grow up in Nazareth. They were unable to understand how one who was a tradesman and who came from a poor home could possibly be a special messenger from God. The Jews resisted the drawing of God. Only those accept Jesus whom God draws to him. 
The word which John uses for to draw is helquine. The word used in the Greek translation of the Hebrew when Jeremiah hears God say as the authorized version has it, With loving kindness have I drawn thee, Jeremiah 31 verse 3. The interesting thing about the word is that it almost always implies some kind of resistance. It is the word for drawing a heavily laden net to the shore, John 21 verses 6 and 11. It is used of Paul and Silas being dragged before the magistrates in Philippi, Acts 16 verse 19. It is the word for drawing a sword from the belt or from its scabbard, John 18 verse 10. Always there is this idea of resistance. God can draw men, but man's resistance can defeat God's pull. Today the church brings to our consideration the second part of Jesus' message, that whenever reading God's word or listening to its explanation, it is Jesus in person who not only speaks to us but personally becomes our nourishment. While the passage does not explicitly refer to the Eucharist, many Christian traditions see in these verses a foreshadowing of the sacrament of communion. The language of eating Jesus' flesh and drinking his blood in the subsequent verses, John 6 verses 52 to 59, further supports this interpretation. Many early church fathers, like Ignatius of Antioch and Irenaeus, saw this passage as indicative of the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Contemporary scholars often emphasized the eschatological, relating to the end times, and communal aspects of this passage, seeing it as a call to a deeper, ongoing relationship with Christ. Jesus is the bread of life, which means that he is the essential for life, therefore to refuse the invitation and command of Jesus is to miss life and to die. To refuse the offer of Jesus is to miss life in this world and in the world to come, whereas to accept his offer is to find real life in this world and glory in the world to come. Lessons for Growth 1. Seeking the Bread of Life Just as physical bread sustains our bodies, spiritual sustenance is vital for our growth. In today's Gospel, Jesus refers to himself as the Bread of Life, emphasizing the importance of seeking him for spiritual nourishment. 2. Belief in Jesus Jesus emphasizes the necessity of believing in him as the key to eternal life. In terms of personal growth, having faith in higher principles or a purpose can sustain and guide one through life's challenges. 3. Listening and Learning To understand and grow spiritually, we must actively listen to the teachings of Jesus and be open to learning from him. This highlights the importance of being receptive to wisdom and guidance for personal development. 4. Transformation through connection. Emphasizing the intimate connection between the believer and Christ, this passage suggests that true growth comes through a deep and personal relationship with the divine. Similarly, Personal growth often thrives in the context of authentic connections with others. 5. Sustenance for the Journey Just as the Israelites received manna in the desert, Jesus offers himself as the spiritual sustenance needed for the journey of life. This teaches us the importance of drawing on inner strength and faith during challenging times to sustain personal growth. 6. The Promise of Eternal Life through these teachings, Jesus offers the promise of eternal life to those who believe in him. This highlights the importance of having a broader perspective on life and considering the spiritual dimensions of personal growth. 7. Continual Growth and Nourishment The metaphor of bread suggests the importance of continual nourishment for growth. Similarly, Personal growth is a lifelong journey that requires continuous learning, reflection, and spiritual sustenance. Personal question or action for today. What are the junk foods of this world that I have been consuming, and how have they distracted me from my spiritual journey toward God?
In what ways have I resisted or embraced the opportunity to fully taste and see the bread of life that God offers me? How does my daily consumption of spiritual nourishment or lack thereof affect my ability to imitate Jesus in my actions and character? How can I ensure that my life is truly sustained by the bread of life, allowing it to shape who I am becoming? What specific actions or attitudes can I adopt to better invite others to experience the goodness of God through the way I treat them? Concluding Prayer Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you, the source of all goodness. You not only provide for our physical needs, but also offer us the true bread of life, your Son, who nourishes us for eternity. We are grateful for the gift of Jesus, who sustains us and empowers us to carry out the mission you have entrusted to us. Forgive us, Lord, for the times we have sought fulfillment in the empty distractions of this world instead of embracing the life-giving nourishment you offer. Open our hearts to fully appreciate your abundant goodness as we partake in the spiritual food you so generously provide. We thank you for sending Jesus to be our sacrificial offering and our spiritual sustenance. As we journey through life, continue to pour out your Holy Spirit upon us, guiding us to recognize and cherish the many blessings you have given us through Christ. We lift this prayer in worship, repentance, gratitude, and humble request through Jesus, your Son, the Bread of Life, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen.